Well, it's my privilege today to welcome to our podcast, Dr. Jim Dennison. Dr. Dennison is a cultural apologist, and I would add extraordinaire. He helps uh, people respond biblically and redemptively to the vital issues of our day. He's also the co-founder and chief vision officer of the Denison Forum. Uh, their daily article reaches more than 240,000 readers a day, uh, 80,000 listeners to the podcast, and 400,000 Facebook followers, approximately 2.1 million reached through social media. Dr. Dennison, I have to say it's my great privilege to have you on the program and on the podcast today. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you. It's a kind privilege that you've extended to me, Chuck, to be able to be in this conversation with you. Uh, your contribution to a paper we published recently about God's view of taxes and money was just so helpful to us and to our readers as well. I've been grateful for Crown for many, many years, uh, from the time I first became familiar with your ministry as a pastor more than 20 years ago. And so to be able to talk with you about this today is a great privilege for me, and I'm honored. Well, I have to say, I'm a personal fan. You are not a stranger to me from the sense that I read your articles every day, and I highly recommend that those listening to our podcast subscribe and, and join in. And I honestly don't know how you do it, Dr. Dennison, how you are able to have the energy and and to be so current on the issues uh, in such a uh, a timely, relevant way. It seems like you must be reading uh, all the the news well into midnight, and because your article comes out in the morning. How do you do that, Dr. Dennison? Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. And I'm so so privileged, so grateful to be able to focus my attention on this and to kind of do this as my call now. And uh, don't go to a lot of deacons meetings, you know, don't have a lot of other things I used to do as a pastor. I'm grateful for that. So I read a rough draft of the article the day before based on the most uh, recent news. The purpose of the daily article, as you know, is to speak biblical truth to breaking news and to uh, cultural issues, to equip Christians to think and respond biblically about these things. And then I get up at four the next morning, look over the news again, make any changes to the article that need to be made. Sometimes start over if things have changed overnight and we need to kind of begin again. And we'll re-record the video and the podcast if that's necessary. And then we have editors that get up around five. We finish the article around then and have it out the door around 5.30 central time anyway. And, uh, so I have a team of people they get up early with me and help me to finish all this. And uh, I try to do the content. They do all the technology and I couldn't do their job. And I'm so grateful for them. Yeah, that's fantastic. When did you realize that God was calling you to this work when, uh, you, you know, to become a cultural apologist is a very unique uh, place where God has placed you. Was there some point during the pastorate when you realized that there was a broader audience that he wanted you to reach? Well, thank you for that. Really, the story of my entire ministry has been very much this. My father uh, grew up very active in church, fought in the Second World War, and never went to church again. So I grew up in a loving home, but no spiritual life and all my dad's questions. Uh, I was one to Christ as a teenager through the influence of other believers, but still had all these intellectual doubts and questions and issues. C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity really was transforming for me, as for so many others. The first time I'd seen anyone deal with faith intellectually, and so uh, God's call in my life has always been in this space. I did a PhD in philosophy, taught philosophy at Southwestern Seminary and other seminaries uh, before God called me into pastoral ministry. But even all those years as a pastor, really my call was to help our members engage cultural issues, use their influence effectively. And then specifically to answer your kind question, about 12 years ago, a little more than that, a couple in our church in Dallas uh, came to my wife and me with a belief that we should be about a larger ministry that they would help financially. We didn't know what that meant. They didn't quite know either what that meant, but it was their encouragement that led us to start what we call Denison Forum back in 2009 to focus full-time on this. But it's really not a change in trajectory so much as the opportunity to do full-time what I've been doing in many ways for a very long time. I'm always so grateful for that couple. I was with them yesterday, in fact. They're in so many ways the founder, financial founders of this ministry investing in us. So that's really where the change came from the pastorate into this, but the nature of the ministry, the trajectory of it has really really been uh, very similar across the years. Well, they made a great investment. Uh, I'm oh, sure you. they're pleased with the impact that you've had so far. I want to talk to you about uh, cultural issues around finances. Mm. And let's just start with uh, an area where I think you are so strong, mm. and that is what the Bible has to say about finances. I, I, you know, I read your articles and always recognize that you and I are 
often aligned when uh, you speak about finances. And we did have the privilege of uh, supporting mm -hmm. one of your white papers recently. So why do you think the Lord talks so much about money and possessions? Yeah, that's a great question. I really think there are probably three answers to this, and you would know better than me. This is obviously your expertise, and God has just anointed you and your team in this space in a very unique way, for which I'm so grateful. But what occurs to me anyway, as a pastor and a, uh, an apologist, first of all, Jesus is practical. He's interested in the practical issues of life, and really no issue more practical in our lives than money in his day and ours as well. But second, he knows that how we spend our money in so many ways reflects our highest priorities. He said, where your treasure is, that your heart will be also. I remember hearing about somebody that wrote a new biography of Napoleon once they found his checkbook. They felt like that would give them a window into his real priorities. Uh, uh, Paul Tillich said, we all have an ultimate concern, a highest priority, and the way we spend and use money is often a window into that. And so Jesus wanted to speak to that, wanted to speak to our highest priorities. But then I think on a third level, he wanted us to understand what you articulate so well, and that is that God is the owner of everything that we're to have a transformational relationship with Him, that we're to bear our cross daily, that we're to be submitted in every dimension of our lives. And He knew that if we would submit our finances to Him, that's no guarantee we'll submit our entire lives, but it certainly is a major step in that direction. I remember the story, you may know if this is true, but the story is that when Sam Houston was baptized as a believer after a fairly notorious life, at least spiritually, he insisted on wearing his wallet into the baptistry because he said it needed to be baptized baptized as well. And he was right about that. Whether that's true physically, it's certainly true spiritually, that uh, Jesus wants to be Lord of all of us, and he knows if he's Lord of our money, that's a significant step in that direction. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, when I think about where we are right now, we're nearing tax, the end of tax season. It has been extended, the deadline, of course, uh, which has been unique to the pandemic. Uh, but the Lord said to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto him what is his. Uh, I'd like you to comment on that particular passage. How do you see that commentary relating to us today? Yeah, it's a great question. It's obviously one of the, maybe the most foundational statement in the context of how we relate to God and, and stewardship of our resources. First of all, the background of it is, I think, fascinating. The coin that Jesus asked to see and that was really at the heart of the controversy, as you know, was a coin that was published by the Romans, printed by the Romans. It was the only one they had that had an actual image of Caesar itself on one side and an image of the God of peace, goddess of peace on the other. So it's highly idolatrous. And what he's being asked is really a hot button question. If he says, yes, pay these taxes, then he's looking like an idolater. And then uh, perhaps his movement will fail. And that's what the these religious authorities are after. If he says, don't pay this, then maybe the Romans will arrest him and take him off their hands and consider him a, uh, in some way a rebel or a threat to the empire. And so there's really a political issue going on in the midst of all this. But Jesus articulates a larger kingdom eternal principle, even beyond that coin, when he makes a statement that you just quoted. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. It's the principle of two kingdoms. It's what uh, St. Augustine spoke of when you talk about a, uh, the city of God and the city of the world, and the fact that we live as citizens in both, that we're to give to this world what this world is owed. That's why Romans 13 tells us to pay tax, tells us to submit to authorities, that we're called to pray for the king and all of those in authority. And Peter tells us to honor the emperor. We're to give to this culture what, we're, what is owed. We're to be good citizens. Justin the Martyr, one of the first apologists, uh, made that kind of a hard of his apology. Christians make good citizens. So that's the one side of it, is we're to pay tax, we're to be good citizens. And the other side is to recognize that God is ultimately Lord of all. And we, when we give to God what is God's, we're giving Him our hearts, our lives, our ultimate loyalty, our ultimate allegiance as the ultimate King of kings and Lord of lords. So we live in both worlds. We're citizens of both countries, but our ultimate loyalty is to Jesus. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, it reminds me of what Larry Burkett used to teach around uh, Luke 16, when the scripture says, if you're faithful with a little thing, you'll be trusted with more. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you're faithful with your use of worldly wealth, he'll trust you with true riches. And Larry used to say, he's telling us to be faithful with a little thing like money. And the bigger things are the things of the heart, the things that God wants to 
uh, impart to us beyond the finances. I want to talk a little bit about the cultural issues of our day because you addressed idolatry in that particular explanation of that passage in Matthew. What do you see on the horizon or what are the things that you're most concerned about when it comes to personal finance or economics uh, and, and our culture today? That's a great question. And really, there are several issues in this, several lanes on the freeway, I guess you could say. Kind of the background behind that, I would mention very, very briefly is, and you know this, and a lot of uh, believers are aware of this, the shift that's occurred in recent decades to believe in this postmodern context, there's no such thing as truth. They're just your truth and my truth. So tolerance is the highest value that exists. And authenticity, personal authenticity, is claimed to be the path to flourishing, personal and social flourishing. Well, the biblical worldview says no to that. The biblical worldview says that, in fact, we're to be submitted to God, that He is our authority, not ourselves, that it's not authenticity, but submission and surrender, that it's what the Lord asks us to do. Well, that conflict between this biblical call to be crucified with Christ, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, to make Jesus Lord against this secular, kind of a secular religion almost, this secular vision that says that personal authenticity and personal enlightenment is what matters, is now coming to a head in a way that's unprecedented in American history. We're seeing this challenge relative to what's known as the Equality Act, the so-called Equality Act, which has passed the House, it's before the Senate now, President Biden says he'll sign it. It would elevate LGBTQ protections to 1964 Civil Rights Act protected class with no appeal to Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So what that would mean would be in principle, just as examples, if you're in a faith-based hospital, you might be required to perform abortions. You might be required to perform sex change surgeries. If you're in an adoption, Option ministry, you might be required to allow same-sex couples to adopt. If you're in a school, you might be required to allow transgender uh, biological males to compete against females and have access to locker rooms and restrooms and all that's inside that. Churches might be required to allow their resources to be in their campuses to be used for same-sex weddings. And our finances, to get more to your point, our taxes could very well be required to support abortion and everything else I just said. So we're at a place now where the culture is exceedingly and increasingly seeing this secular vision, this kind of secular future around personal authenticity as the way forward. And we're increasingly being painted as bigoted, prejudiced, homophobic, narrow-minded, dangerous to society if we disagree. And a lot of that's going to come to play around finances and taxation and uh, the ability to give to Caesar what is Caesar's while giving to God what is God's. Well, you've seen the corporate world join with, uh, in many cases, full support behind the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're threatening to do punitive things towards those who don't fall in line, such as cancel your access to their platforms, do all sorts of things that could cause significant financial loss or hardships or, or challenges for people into the future. Uh, Dr. Dennison, do you, do you see that coming at us rapidly now, something that we need to be braced for in terms of um, a, I think maybe an economic persecution where we, we get limited, we get constrained, we lose some of our freedoms, possibly even the ability to talk about these things as openly as we're doing right now. Do you see that coming? I do believe all of that is coming. I absolutely do. And I'm not saying that to be unkind. If I believed what they believe, I would understand that trajectory. One way to look at this that may help a little bit, Chuck, many people on the other side of this conversation see us the way you and I would see racists. We, you and I would understand the belief that KKK members uh, could be restricted from social media platforms. Those are private platforms. They, they can decide what they want to put on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, just like we can decide what to put on our website and you can decide what to put on yours. And we would never let a KKK member post something on our website or use our social media platforms to advance their agenda. Well, that's the way many on this other side see us. They see us as being just as discriminatory, just as bigoted, just as dangerous to society as if we were burning crosses in front yards. And so I absolutely understand, tragically, 
the future in which it's very possible and plausible that we could see a day when access to social media platforms could be restricted. I think there could be a day when the NCAA decides not to allow faith-based schools to participate in athletic programs as if their student handbooks uh, affirm biblical morality. You may remember that article in USA Today when Oral Roberts made the Sweet 16 in NCAA, castigating the NCAA for allowing Oral Roberts to participate in the tournament because of their biblical moral stamp. I saw in USA Today, I don't know why I'm picking on USA Today, but saw this morning an op-ed in which they were castigating those that run AT&T Stadium here in Dallas, so-called Cowboy Stadium, because they might allow it to be used for a Promise Keepers event in the future, and their belief that Promise Keepers ought not be given that access. So certainly access, whether it's to physical facilities or to social media platforms, participating in voluntary organizations like the NCAA, certainly access could be restricted in the future. There's a very real possibility where this turns not just from civil to criminal, I was in a a teleconference recently doing a consult with an organization in which we had a member from the Alliance Defending Freedom on the call. And he was explaining to us that if Equality Act becomes law, and now so-called SOGI, which is sexual orientation, gender identity laws, become or individuals become protected class. And then let's say, for example, your school uh, con- continues to maintain your biblical standards that you won't employ, uh, let's say, a transgender individual. And you continue to say that after the Equality Act becomes law. You could see, he could see a day when a judge issues an injunction. If you don't obey the injunction, somebody goes to jail. It's that kind of possibility out there. I'm not predicting that. I'm not saying that will happen. But he, this attorney, with Alliance Defending Freedom, who makes this his specialty, said that is an outcome that is certainly within the realm of possibility as you play this forward. How do you address the issue or the tension that exists between speaking the truth and showing the love of God to those that we have disagreements with? I take exception to the the modern definition of tolerance. Mm. Historically, it meant that we have to have a disagreement but we agree to tolerate that tension. We agree to uh, uh, see each other as being able to hold that tension equally, that we disagree, but we will tolerate that difference. The new definition does not allow for that difference to exist. It wants to eradicate that difference. So as believers, how do we hold that? How do we manage the, the tension to holding to truth and yet showing God's love to people? Boy, what a great question. What a challenging question. Ephesians 4.15 calls us to speak the truth in love. That's what makes us unique in this conversation, quite frankly, as followers of Jesus, is the call to do both of those, to speak the truth, but to do so in love. The temptation is to do one or the other, to speak the truth or to love in the belief that we can't do both when clearly we're called to do both. So as this challenges me, there are really two or three steps in this that have been real important to me. The first is to every single day, get alone with the Lord, and it's Ephesians 5.18, being filled with the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit of God to fill me, to control me, to empower me, to make me, to have the character of Jesus, to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ask the Holy Spirit to help us speak the truth in love to do so in a way that recognizes we're beggars helping beggars find bread, to recognize I'm no less a sinner than anybody else is. I'm not sinning in this space. I'm not sinning by demanding that people give up their religious freedoms and so forth, but I'm maybe sinning in other spaces that they're not. And so it's praying for the Lord to help me to have the humility to understand that this person is not my enemy. Satan is the enemy. This person has been deceived. This person is, is, is living. Well, my wife used to tell our sons, lost people act like lost people. When people are deceived, they don't know they're being deceived. You're in the dark and don't know you're in the dark. Well, my responsibility is to love that person, recognizing that I'm just as much in need of grace as they are. And I can only do that if the Holy Spirit will help me. So every single day, we ask the Spirit to fill us, empower us, to give us that ability to speak the truth in love. And then when we're challenged, when we face that opportunity to look down on that person, to condemn that individual, to feel superior to them in some way. We pray again. We recognize this, and we stop and we say, no, Lord, help me to love them as you do. 
Help me to see them as you do. Help me to remember that Jesus died for them, and I need your grace just as much as they do. A missionary that I was working with years ago prayed something I've never forgotten. He said, Lord, break my heart for what breaks your heart. This person breaks Jesus' heart, just like my sins break Jesus' heart. So let's pray for the humility to do what you suggest and speak the truth in love. And I've always thought, Dr. Dennison, that the message of God's mercy and grace is far superior to the message of tolerance. Yes. I'm, I'm not only willing to tolerate you, which to me is not a very pleasing relationship <laughs> that I agree to tolerate you, mm-hmm. but through God's love and mercy and grace, I'm willing to see you uh, as forgiven and redeemed before the Lord. Right. Should you recognize his sacrifice for your sin, then, then we, are, we are no different than each other. We are both in need of his mercy and grace and, and can find our footing as uh, his children who have something better than just tolerating each other exactly right. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? And that's why we don't want to just concede this ground. Ryan Anderson in the Wall Street Journal recently said, we're not just asking for the right to be wrong here, which is how the culture sees us. We're really contesting for souls. We're contending for the faith here because of all of those that are victims of the so-called tolerance mantra, the so-called tolerance mentality that tolerates that which is dangerous to souls, which is dangerous to marriages, which is dangerous to children, dangerous to families. There's so much secular evidence for the truth of God's spiritual word. I saw the other day that, for instance, uh, men that divorce have eight times the suicide rate of those that don't. I saw something the other day about the degree to which women's earnings go down, sometimes fourfold if they divorce. I'm not saying divorce is the unpardonable sin, of course. I'm just saying there are consequences to violating what God says about marriage. There are consequences. You can look at suicide rates. You can look at at, um, at depression rates. You can look at uh, STAs in the context of same-sex behavior. Uh, there are just so many consequences to not living the way God wants us to live. God's not a cosmic killjoy. He's not trying to stamp out that which we want to do. He's guiding us to that which is our best life. He knows our best life, and living biblically is to live our best life, and that needs to be our message. Well, when I think about what we started with, with the passage of rendering to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, Mm -hmm. you're saying, and I agree with you, that Caesar is going to make more and more demands of us. Caesar is going to want to take a bigger uh, portion of our income in the future, and maybe even take away some of it where historically we would have objected. We may not have the opportunity to object. So I think idolatry comes into focus again, because I've always said you know what you love the most by how you respond when you lose it. Mm. And uh, we're going to see a loss of some rights, loss of some freedoms. And and I think through even... uh, not only the government, but corporate activities, we're going to see losses of uh, some of the financial abilities that we've had, some of the freedom in that space, and maybe even see some punitive actions taken against the believer. And I think we'll find out if we're idolaters, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dennison. (laughs) That loss will help us to reveal that uh, the government uh, can have our resources uh, when demanded of us, Uh, And we can do so joyfully because God has our heart. Uh, They cannot uh, take that away from us. As you wrote about in your article, there's, uh, I think you, I'm going to look at the term you use. I thought it was so well done. There is some people who see Christianity as a transactional religion versus a transformational relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, you wrote that when we see it as a transformational relationship, the financial aspect of uh, our lives is uh, lower uh, significance and priority to us because we have something better. Well, that's right, I believe. There's really a whole background behind this as a student of philosophy, a philosopher professor over these years, that uh, is, I think, an important thing for us to understand. In the Jewish uh, context, uh, prior to the Greco-Roman world, they understood that our lives belong to God. You read the book of Leviticus, and you see how God cares about every dimension of our lives, every day of our lives. Well, in the Greco-Roman world, that's very different. They see the gods at the top of Mount Olympus, not as people you want a personal relationship with. What you did with these gods and why they had so many gods 
gods, was you had a business relationship with them. You sacrifice on the altar so the God will bless your crops, so to speak. You're going to war, so you sacrifice to Mars or Aries. You need wisdom, so you sacrifice to Athena. It's this transactional business sort of a deal. And that's why when you go to Ephesus, as I've done so many times, or you travel to Rome, as I've led groups there as well, you see all of these temples to these various gods. You would just have this transaction with these gods. Well, that's this Greco-Roman world that unfortunately came to dominate Western civilization. So that today, we bring the Bible into that, and we see Scripture through that lens. We go to church on Sunday, so God will bless us on Monday. Uh, we give some of our money, so God will bless our money. C.S. Lewis says, we're like honest taxpayers that pay our tax, but certainly hope there's money left over to do what we want. We start the day in Bible study, so God will bless our day. We have this transactional religion. What God wants is a transformational relationship. He wants to lead every dimension of our lives. He wants to bless every dimension of our lives, wants to use every dimension of our lives. But he can only lead those that will follow. He can only give if we'll receive. Uh, my grandfather, my father's father, was a carpenter did that, lost his farm in the Great Depression, and learned how to be a carpenter in Kansas, and did that until nearly when he died at the age of 99, had a pretty amazing life. But he would tell you as a carpenter, he can only change the wood he can touch. He can only paint the wood. He can only sand the wood. He can only work with the wood that he can touch. Well, if we're going to restrict God to Sunday, if we're going to restrict God to 10% of our income, let's say, if we're going to restrict God to the few minutes we spend in Bible study, then we're letting God paint a very small part of the furniture. We're letting Him lead a very small part of our lives, and we're missing so much of what the God of the universe wants to do in us and with us and through us if we'll seek that transformational relationship with Him. Well, I just finished my personal uh, reading through Job, but that's where I'm at in my daily uh, Bible reading. And mm -hmm. I always enjoy getting to the end of the book of Job, by the way. I'm yeah. sure <laughs> most people do, uh, because it's such a story of redemption. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan thought that Job would uh, capitulate on his relationship mm -hmm. with the Lord if the Lord took the blessings away. And he tested his heart and found his heart to be true. He did not capitulate. He stayed true to his faith, even though all the the blessings and all the things that he cherished in life were lost. Mm -hmm. And I, I sense that we're all going to experience some of that same testing, probably not to the extent that Job did, of course, mm -hmm. which is an extreme case in the scripture. Yeah. But uh, the, the story of Job's redemption to me is a story of not only his faithfulness to the Lord, but the Lord's faithfulness to him and how he was restored uh, beyond what he ever dreamed or imagined. And uh, as we talk about loss, as we talk about the fearful things that could be in our future, I think there's also a side of it that to me is tremendously exciting uh, because we can lose all things that we hold in our hand and yet lose nothing of eternal value. That is so true. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's an exciting time to be alive. I think it's an exciting time mm -hmm. to stand for uh, the truth of the gospel. And, and, and I appreciate you equipping people mm -hmm. to be ready for those times. Well, thank you. I've been to Cuba 10 times over the years, started going down 20 years ago. And I can tell you that Cubans are exactly what you're describing. They're exhibit A of what it is to have a greater joy than the world can offer, to have a greater peace than the world can provide. And these Cuban believers that know every single day that they could lose their homes, they could lose their jobs, they could go to jail, it could be worse, live in a dependence on Jesus that allows Jesus to be so real in their lives to be so active in their lives, to not just be risen on Sunday or on Easter, but risen every moment of every day. They have a personal, daily, transformational experience with the living, risen Lord Jesus that puts so much of our spirituality to shame. We started going to Cuba thinking we were going to help them and discovered very quickly we go to Cuba so they can help us, so they can encourage us, so they can inspire us. There's a Cuban pastor for whom I pray every single day who's really my pastor. I could take a long time and describe the cost he has paid, the sacrifices he has made, the persecution that he and his family have suffered for following Jesus. But if you add him in this, on this call right now, his joy is just transforming and is so appealing, and you'd want that. You'd say, man, I'll give up what he gave up to get what he got. That's kind of Job's story. That's my friend Carlos's story. And that can be our story as well, if we're willing, as you say, to make Jesus our ultimate concern, our highest value.
I did not realize we had that in common, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dennis and I. My exhibit A would be the people and friends that I know in Zimbabwe. Oh. Uh, they lived through uh, all the nightmare scenarios that we fear in this country. They had a dictator that uh, seized their property, took the land away from them, did not compensate them, did not allow them to take pictures off the wall or to uh, even grab their wallet on the way out. Uh, they lost everything, their livelihood, their history, their their career. All of it was gone in a flash. And then hyperinflation destroyed all of their savings. Mm -hmm. So they ended up with absolutely nothing. But most of them have told me it was well worth it to come to a full dependency on Jesus Christ and to experience daily joy without all the things that they used to rely upon and think were so important. Mm, yeah, that's the story, isn't it? That's, I think, one of the ways that God will redeem this. I believe God redeems all that he allows. We so desperately, as you know, need a spiritual awakening, a genuine transformational movement in our in our country. Every one of the four spiritual awakenings that have happened in American history was preceded by desperation, was preceded by God's people doing what you just described in Zimbabwe and what I've seen in Cuba. There have been more than a million Cubans that have come to Christ in the last 10 years. Christianity Today speaks of the Cuban revival. Well, all of that is as a result of the desperation we're talking about that drew God's people to himself. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Well, I have learned the hard way uh, that I won't trust Jesus more than I need to trust Jesus. Mother Teresa said, you'll never know Jesus is all you need till Jesus is all you have. And in my own life, the more comfortable I've been, the more complacent I become. It's Jesus warning about that rich man getting through the eye of the needle. And it's just true that so much of the time, I'm no more dependent on Jesus than I need to be. And so maybe the Lord is going to use what we're describing right now as a way of calling his people to a dependence on him that would be a catalyst for the kind of spiritual awakening we need so desperately. Well, like you, I've uh, traveled extensively, Dr. Dennison, and I have friends inside of China where I've been and taught many, many times who say that the revival there broke out at Tiananmen Square when you know, the government took away, stripped away their ability to have any form of, of religious practice or belief. They tried to declare there is no God mm -hmm. and control the thought processes and, and the need for faith that the people had. And out of desperation from Tiananmen Square came uh, the spiritual revival that we see today. And as the current administration cracks down on the church, my friends there say they don't realize it, but they've started a church strengthening program uh, because the church grows stronger when there's opposition like that. It does, and it becomes more of what the church was always meant to be, doesn't it? You know, it took me a long time to understand that churches aren't buildings. Uh, the church wasn't allowed legally to own a building, as you know, until the fourth century. The oldest building, as historians say, that we can identify as being a church, so to speak, is a house in Seville, Spain, with a cross on the wall that dates back to AD 278. Really wasn't until Constantine legalized the church that we started owning buildings, and then we got clergy to work in the buildings while laity, so-called, which is an unbiblical idea, went to the building to watch the clergy do their jobs. And none of that is what Jesus thinks of as the church. So if they take away the buildings, we become the church we were always supposed to be. If they won't let the clergy do what we want the clergy to do, then everybody becomes the minister that God wants us to be. And it's like throwing water on a grease fire. It really just spreads it's, it's why, the, as Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's why we're seeing in Cuba, and, and I have seen in Beijing, and, and we're seeing in so much of the Muslim world, more Muslims coming to Christ in the last 15 years than the previous 15 centuries. And so much of that is because of radical Islam and its persecution of the church and how that's driving people to Jesus. And then Jesus is showing up. And Jesus is doing what only Jesus can do. He said that if, and I love taking people to Caesarea Philippi, and we're at Matthew 16, where we're looking at the actual gates of hell, that cave that's there. And Jesus said, on this rock, I'll build my church. And then pointing at that cave, at that gates of hell, he said, and the gates of hell will never withstand its assault. That's his promise. That's why he started the church, not at the temple in Jerusalem, not at the synagogue at Capernaum. He started the church at the gates of hell. Our job is to attack the gates of hell. Well, you've got to be near the gates of hell to attack the gates of hell. And so that's just as you're saying, how God has always worked and how we can trust him to work again. Dr. Dennison, are just switching gear to a few personal questions. Mm. How has God used money in your own life, in your own personal journey of faith? 
Yeah, thank you. Well, one way is a very personal level. Uh, my wife manages our personal finances or we'd be in jail. Uh, yeah. I'm so grateful to her for doing <laughs> that and doing that so well, uh, so much better than I ever could. She had a business major in college at one point and has done so well with that. And so on one level, it's made me very grateful for my wife and grateful for all of those that I've partnered with in ministry over the years who have managed the financial resources of churches and now this ministry and have freed me up to do what I do because they do what they do so very well. So on one level, it's made me very grateful for those that, like you, are very good at this on a level that I'm not. But on a second, God has used money in my life to show me his ability to bless every dimension of my life. Uh, We grew up, uh, I'll be I'll talk about family for just a moment, grew up in a home that we thought was middle class in Houston. Looking back, I realized it wasn't uh, even close to that. Uh, I qualified for some very basic uh, government grants in college because of the level of income that our family had or didn't have. And I grew up really very impoverished, even more so than uh, we understood at the time to be the case. And uh, from there till here and the opportunity that I have now to do what I do, I just recognize because I've kind of been on the other side of that, that God is a God of abundance. We often have this scarcity mentality where we think God only gives to us what we make him give, what we kind of coerce him to give. If we'll just pray enough and if we'll just do enough stuff that somehow we'll kind of make God bless us, we'll kind of wring out of him uh, what we need him and want him to do in our lives. And it's just the opposite. I have experienced God to be an absolute God of abundance, a father who wants to bless his kids. I've been keeping two of our grandkids this week, and I can tell you there's nothing I won't do for them. That's the privilege of being a grandfather. You spoil them and return them. It's the greatest job in the world. But the way I see my grandkids is the way my father sees me as someone he wants to bless, somebody he wants to provide for. And I've experienced that financially in a way that has no explanation except the grace of God. Amen. Amen. I can I can join you in that, not only with God's faithfulness, but with that illustration of those grandchildren. Mm. Uh, when we spend time with them, our heart just overflows with mm. uh, desire to bless them in every way, as you said. Uh, we've got to wrap it up. I wish we didn't because this has been so exciting for me personally, and I know for those who will be tuning in. Uh, If you had uh, just a couple of biblical financial principles that you felt were imperative to pass on to others, what would your list be? What would it include? Even even the practices, maybe not just principles, but some of your own practices, Dr. Mm. Dennison. Thank you for that. Uh, the first principle that comes to a comes to a practice is what you wrote about in our white paper together, and what I know you speak of, uh, all, and what Crown is all about. And that is that God is the owner of all of this; that all of it belongs to Him. There's no private public. And something I think we need to remember financially is that God's as interested in what you keep as what you give. He's as interested in what you do with your money. The world doesn't see as what the world does see. Wants to be Lord of all of that, so He can bless all of that, so we can use all of that, so that He can redeem all of that for His greatest glory. Uh, To that point, kind of to a second place, God is calling us, I believe, to be more sacrificial financially in these days than perhaps we have been willing or comfortable to be. C.S. Lewis says that if your charitable giving doesn't cost you more than is comfortable to give, you're not giving enough. If your charitable contributions are easy to make, you're not making them, you're not making them on a high enough level. They ought to cost you something. There ought to be something you can't do that you wanted to do. There ought to be a sacrifice in this because that sacrifice is how we respond in gratitude to the grace of God. And then God uses that sacrifice to advance his kingdom. I will always wonder the mystery of this, Chuck, why God has chosen to finance his kingdom through his people. Now, he's not limited to us. We all know that, of course, owns the cattle on a thousand and hills, but he chooses to, to, in so many ways, finance his kingdom advance through the gifts of his people. So in the sacrifice of these days and the challenge of these days, I would just urge those that are hearing us today to pray, Lord, am I giving enough to your kingdom purposes? Am I giving sacrificially enough out of all that you have given me so that we can rise to meet the challenge of these days? Am I being faithful and sacrificial to the God who gave everything for me? When I take people to Israel, we always, of course, go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's there that I remind them not only that Jesus chose in that place to die for their sins, but the Father chose to send His Son to the cross for our sins, that the Father said no to His Son so He could say yes to us. And then I urge those in that garden, never again wonder if God loves you. 
know how much God loves you. Respond to that love and gratitude for that grace by giving of your life, not just your finances, sacrificially to advance his kingdom so the world can know what we know and the world can experience the grace that has changed our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennison. I think one thing I did poorly opening up is to help people understand how they could subscribe to the daily article, how they could get uh, on your podcast, how they could find you on social media. I sincerely want them to enjoy the daily benefit that I get from that subscription. So would you tell them how to do that? You bet. The website's the easiest place, denisonforum.org, D-E-N-I-S-O-N forum.org. That's where people can read the daily article, can subscribe there if they like. They can get that as video or audio. I make it in a video and audio every day as well. They can see the white papers. They can see our white paper that we did together. They can see the other books, the other content that's there. They can see the media I do and have access to all of that as well. All our digital resources are free because of so many faithful investors and partners that have supported our ministry, the total reach of of all of our brands together now is about four and a half million. And all of that is made possible by the faithful investments of our partners. And so all our digital resources are free. And if folk will just go to that website, denisonforum.org, that's where they can get access to that content. Well, thank you, Dr. Denison. And will you tell Ryan, I'm a big fan as well. I appreciate his work. And uh, we look forward to getting to know each other better in the days ahead and supporting each other, helping us through uh, whatever may come our way. And I'm just delighted to have gotten to know you better today. It's my privilege. Thanks so much for the honor of this conversation. Thank you.